Okay, guys, uh, here we go. We're another Israel 101. Welcome those of you watching online. Carol, I know you're watching. We just talked to you. This is the tape. This is the session that we just talked to you on about a half hour ago, so glad you're here. Um, today, as you know, we are in a state of emergency in New Mexico because of the tremendous weather pattern that is here. We have all this snow and ice, and if you uh, look here in the room, these are the people that braved the state of emergency and came to Israel 101, even though we are in an official state of emergency in Albuquerque. So Sandy, say hi to the camera, please. Hello. And Roger. And this is my Aunt Kathy and Uncle Dan. Go ahead and stand up and say hi to the camera. Hello. Hello. There they are. They're here from North Dakota, so we figured if they came from North Dakota, we definitely got to be here. So right. they'll be joining us. And then you all know my wife, Connie. If not, Hello. there she is. And Monica. Hi. And Rachel, Monica's mom. Hello. There we are. So this is all we have today because it's between Christmas and New Year's. And a lot of the folks that are going to be going are on vacation, Christmas vacation and that. But we're having it anyway. Just so Uncle Dan and I <coughs> could meet some of these people, and they're here, so we'll have an Israel 101. So this is us. So, here we go. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to go backwards a little bit and do some more map studies, and uh, get something that's really important for us to understand as we get into Israel. Um, one of the more confusing things about the trip is we're traveling around Israel. We'll be jumping from Old Testament to New Testament times, and then back to Old Testament times, and so there's going to be a lot of jumping around as we travel. For instance, when we leave Tel Aviv here and we head up north, we're going to go to Caesarea by the sea, and we're going to see the ruins of um, Herod, his, his, his little place there. We're going to see where um, Pontius Pilate would have lived in this area. We're going to see the auditoriums there and everything. And then we go right up to Mount Carmel, and we jump back into the Old Testament. And we're going to be looking where Elijah... Uh, had his contest with the prophets of Baal, and then we end up in Nazareth very quickly, and then we look over at Armageddon, and then we go over to Cana, and then we go over to the Sea of Galilee, so we're jumping Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament quite a bit. So that's one of the advantages of the Israel 101 is we kind of set the stage so you can follow where we're going and what we're seeing. But today I want to spend time in the civil war that took place in Israel. And it's very important that we understand this because as we're in the northern part of Israel, it, they refer to it sometimes as Israel, sometimes as Judah down south, other times as Israel all over the place, sometimes not Judah but Judea. We're going to look at the difference between that. We're going to look where Samaria was. We're going to see the capital of Israel was Samaria, but eventually becomes a region. We're going to look again at the West Bank. We're going to look at what took place with the Civil War. That's it. That's what we're doing today. So we're going to be looking at that to make certain we understand that very well. Otherwise, it gets a little bit confusing. So here we go. Heavenly Father, thanks again just for time to uh, prepare ourselves for a trip to Israel. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with us here today. And Lord, we look forward to uh, just enjoying the Holy Land together as a group and having a blast over there now in just about six months. So we invite your presence here in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, <clears throat> this is how Israel looked, or how the Holy Land looked, after the Civil War. So I want to go up to the time of the Civil War first. So, before that took place, Israel had this border here. This is the northern border. My finger's tracing it. And then over to uh, this <coughs> Jordan River plant here. And then it shot down here, and then came down in a real rough way around Edom this way. That was Israel. At this time, David ruled and Solomon ruled. It was a very powerful nation, one of the wealthiest nations in this whole area. We see we had the Arameans up here to the north, modern-day Syria and Iraq. We had the Ammonites, modern-day Jordan over here. We had the Moabites, more of Jordan over here. And then we had the Edomites down to the south. So we had Edom, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Arameans, the Phoenicians up to the north, and over here we have the Philistia, the Philistines, right in this area here. I can write that up, but that's who they are. So that's what we have for a map. And I want to read this to you so we get it. Solomon is the king, and he had the perfect opportunity to do amazing things. He had the wealth, he had the peace. God said, whatever you want, I'll give you. He says, give me wisdom to rule a nation. God says, because you didn't ask for something for yourself, I'm going to give you that wisdom, but I'm going to give you long life and tremendous wealth as well. And 
he's the wisest man who's ever recorded living. The Proverbs are written by him. The Song of Solomon is written by him. Ecclesiastes is written by him. A wise, wise man. But as we know, he got into trusting Egypt and his military might, the horses. He started to trust his, his um, treaties with all the neighboring nations and city-states. Every time he'd send, sign a, tree, a foreign treaty, he'd marry one of their wives. So all those wives tell us that he had all these treaties. He was trusting his diplomacy. He was trusting his military might and his wealth. The three things that in Deuteronomy had told kings don't do. Remember when Moses said, there's coming a day when you're going to go into the promised land, you're going to want a king like the nations all around you. When you do choose a king, make sure he's from your own people. Make sure he doesn't multiply horses, his military, wives, his diplomacy, or gold, his wealth. Don't trust in that, but he should be a man of the book. Solomon violated all three of those areas. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of his life then, in 1 Kings, I'll just read it. <clears throat> Towards the end of his life, he's trusted in all the wrong things. Adversaries rise up and start to creep in on his borders. And then it says, <clears throat> then Solomon's servant... A guy by the name of Jeroboam. And we're gonna this guy becomes a pretty important guy. He's a servant of Solomon. It says this. Then Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite. So he'd be from this area right in here. An Ephraimite. From Zareda, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against King Solomon. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the millow and repaired the damages to the city of David. We talked about the city of David just to the south of the Temple Mount. That area is called the millow. Well, he rebuilt all that, repaired the damage to the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, great reputation, a strong personality. And Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, met him on the way. So get the picture. Jeremiah is busy working. He's working for Solomon. He's a top dog. He's one of Solomon's major lieutenants. He'd be like the deputy of, of the rebuilding projects of Israel. He's a, he's a high, heavy hitter. And he's walking out of Jerusalem, and the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, met him on the way. And Ahijah clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. And then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it to twelve pieces. He said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to you, Jeroboam. But Solomon will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. So this Ahijah says, I'm going to give you, Jeroboam, the northern ten tribes, right here. I didn't divide the tribes up here, but this divides into ten. He says, and down here, there will be just two tribes. Judah plus one tribe. So there's going to be two tribes in the south, ten tribes in the north. So he says, I'm going to give you ten tribes, and David, or Solomon, will get two. And he says, um, because they have forsaken me, worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, Milcom of the people of Ammon, they have not walked in my ways to do what is right. And um, however, I'll not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but because I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, who I chose to keep my commandments and statutes, but I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you. So Jeroboam gets the ten tribes. He says, I'm not going to do it out of Solomon's hands, because that's David's son, and because of David, I'm not going to do it to Solomon. But I will do it to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, he'll get the two tribes. So Rehoboam becomes Solomon's son. Well, Solomon hears about this. Of course, what's he going to do? He tries to kill Jeroboam. So Jeroboam takes off to Egypt. He's down in Egypt. Solomon's reigning. Rehoboam's his son. He's training Rehoboam up to be the next king. Solomon dies. You know the story. Rehoboam comes to the throne. The advisors of Solomon come to Rehoboam and say, Rehoboam, your dad, with his building projects and all, he's gotten a little bit crazy on the taxes. Back off the taxes, and the people will follow you forever. Rehoboam listened to the wisdom of the older advisors of his dad. He says, just a second. And he went with all his high school buddies. He said, I'm the new king. What should we do? And basically, he pulled a Governor Martinez. <laughs> he got all the friends together, and they had some fun. And he said, forget about it. Forget about this. Mm -hmm. You're the 
to a king. Stick it to them. You're the king. Whatever you want, man, do it. it says that Rehoboam listened to the advice of his friends rather than the older advisors. He meets with the people of Israel, and he says, You think my dad was tough? My little finger will be heavier than what my dad hit you with. And, of course, the people of Israel, they go, we don't need you. We love David. We put up with David's son, but who are you? we got nothing to do with you. He said, Israel, to your tents. And there was a break. And that break took place. It was a complete split of the nation, just like that prophet had said, without bloodshed. They threatened war, and uh, God used a prophet to stop it. And there was this break here now. So now we have Israel. They maintain the name Israel, the ten tribes to the north here. That's Israel. Prior to 1 Kings 12, when this break takes place, Israel referred to all the promised land. After 1 Kings 12, Israel referred just to this top ten tribes here. The bottom two tribes, and it turns out to be the tribe of Judah, which is down here, and also the tribe of Benjamin, which is up here. Small little tribe. So Benjamin and Judah become the two tribes that form the nation of Judah. Now we're going to see as we look at this, the key is, is that Jerusalem... Come on in, come on in, Lisa. Okay, I'll be right here. Yeah, that's fine. But Jerusalem, the city here, turns out to be the city that God says, I've chosen a nation where I want to be worshipped. And the city God chose and told them to make as their center was Jerusalem. And even though there's ten tribes here, only two tribes here... Even though Rehoboam made a big old mistake. Is David with you? Yes. yes. We'll, we'll put your husband next to you. There you go. And even though Rehoboam made the mistake, even though there's ten tribes up here, this down here, Judah, becomes the godly section, the godly <laughs> state in Israel after First Kings up. So this is the capital. Jerusalem is the capital of Judah now. Israel has no capital at this point. But something crazy takes place. And what takes place here is this. With Jeroboam up here and Rehoboam down here, Jeroboam looks at Jerusalem and freaks out. Because he says, wait a minute, all my people are going to go down to Jerusalem three times a year. And if they go down there, Rehoboam's going to win their hearts. And they're going to come back and assassinate me. I've got to do something. And what's crazy is, is he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build an altar right here for you guys. Right on the border. Right before you have to go down to Jerusalem, right here. I'm going to build an altar here. I'm going to build another altar up here for the people in the north. So you don't have to go all the way down to Jerusalem to worship. We'll build our altar here in Bethel and in Dan. And he starts with an interesting concept, and that is, first off, we see, he starts this worship by convenience. Worship that costs us nothing. That first is seen in the Word of God here in 1 Kings chapter 12 and 13, when Jeroboam says, you only have to go to here. You don't have to go down to Jerusalem. You don't have to go all the way down to Jerusalem. We'll just make it nice for you right here. So we see the, the first thing is this worship by convenience. And then what he does is we get into a chapter 12, verse 31. He says not only that, when, when he did that, first off, when he did that, the Levites who were scattered, remember Levites were scattered throughout the nation? Everybody wanted a Levite. They were the Bible teachers of Israel, when the Levites heard this, they freaked out. And all of the Levites said, Jeroboam, we love you and all, buddy, but you just did something that's way whack. We're out of here. And all of the Levites went down to Jerusalem. So all of a sudden, those who could teach them the word of God were gone. His priesthood left. The Levites left. So he's got an issue. So what does he do, Jeroboam? He says, well, who wants to be a priest? Come on down! And anybody who wanted to be a priest from any tribe could be a priest. So now, it was by compromise. Where the Word of God said your priest had to be Levites. Priests, Levites. He said, nah, anybody. 
Jerusalem, place of worship. Uh, Dan and Bethel. So he starts to change the way God is worshipped up here, and he forms his own religion, basically. Very similar to what God had ordained. He just changed the place of worship and who's offering the sacrifices. At these two worship sites, he puts up his gold calves. Of all things to put up, he puts up gold calves to represent the God of Egypt, you are the God of Israel. You would think he would remember from Moses and the golden calf incident, but that's what he did. So there's gold calves here, gold calves here, and there's altars here, there's big old altars sitting at Dan and Bethel. The third thing he does is he says, we're not going to have it on that seventh month when they all come down and, and on the first month for Passover and then tabernacles and all the first and seventh month and that. He says, we're going to do ours on the eighth month. So he starts to do it by his own calendar. So worship by calendar. Seventh month? No, we're going to go the month later, the eighth month, for our big harvest celebration. Not tabernacles, the seventh month we'll do ours in the eighth month. So he compromises and changes what's going on. So why do we mention all this? Because when we go to Israel, remember we're going to land in Tel Aviv. We're going to go to Joppa, Tel Aviv area. The next day when we do leave, on Sunday morning when we leave, we're going to go up the coastline to Caesarea. We're going to go up the coastline to Haifa. Haifa is the only spot on this really smooth shore. There's this little bay right here. This is the city of Haifa right here. This is the borderline, the northern border of ancient Israel. It has no significance for us today unless you are part of the Baha'i faith. I don't know how they spell it. Something like that. This is their headquarters of the Baha'i faith is in, is in um, well, ancient Akko right here, Haifa today. So we go here, but then we go to Mount Carmel, over here. We're going to go to Nazareth, we're going to go to Armageddon and all. Then we go to the Galilee, to our kibbutz right here. Then we do all our touring around Galilee, on Galilee. But we also go up into the Golan, remember our Golan Heights study? We're in the Golan Heights, we hit this area here in the Dan <coughs> Reserve. And what's interesting is they got all excited when they found this in their archaeological discoveries. They found this altar of Jeroboam. So when we see it, if you don't know about this and this and this, you go, well, okay, that's nice. It's a big old altar of what? When you realize what it is, it's like, are you stinking kidding me? This is the altar that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, said, come up here and worship here, and you'll see what it looks like. We have a little Bible study here. We'll do a very quick summation of this. It's always fun with my Israel 101 group because my Israel 101 group know the significance of it. And the, the tour guide, we get in the bus afterward, they said, your people know the Old Testament, don't they? Because you guys know about this. But it's very exciting because you're going to see this. We're going through this beautiful nature reserve. It's a little bit of a walk. We come across this. It's stinking crazy. So that's where this is up here. So we kind of have that. The thing you want to remember when it comes to this split now is 1 Kings 11 and 12. That's the important on the time frame as far as realizing that Israel now refers to the 10 tribes only after 1 Kings 11 and 12. And Judah becomes not just a tribe, but the name of the nation to the south. The capital's in Jerusalem. Time goes by at first. What he's going to do is he's going to make his capital, Jeroboam makes his capital down here. But then he'll die, and he becomes the standard for wickedness in the north. When you're reading 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, they'll talk about the kings of the north. And they'll say, this was a bad king. This is a real bad king. He did not follow the Lord, but, but he's, he's not as bad as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He becomes the standard. All the kings of the north are ungodly, every one of them. So every king of the north is ungodly. They all are held up to the standard of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. What made him so bad? This. He led people into false worship. And that becomes the standard right there. So that's the northern ten tribes. As we go through 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, we're going to see that there's going to be a, another king coming up named Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Jezebel comes from way up in here. Her dad's name is Ethbaal. Notice his name, Baal at the end. 
And she is the one that brings Baal worship down into Israel, Jezebel. Well, what Ahab does is he makes his capital in a city right here. He builds this city, and he makes it the capital of Israel, the northern ten tribes here. And he names that city Samaria. So in the Old Testament days, Samaria is the name of a city that comes many years after this split. There was nothing there. He builds the city, calls it Samaria, makes it his capital city. So these become the king and queen of Israel at Samaria. And Samaria now becomes the capital up there. They become very wealthy. When we go to Israel, you'll see why. This is very agricultural. The, 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 the... <sighs> Sandy, Roger, you've been there. Do you remember Galilee? Green or desert? Way green. Do you remember the south? Green or desert? Desert. This is desert. These are the pictures of Israel with the, the sand dunes and the camels. And it's like, whoa. This is like lush. Beautiful. Because of that, they have a lot of dollars. A lot. So the northern ten tribes are doing really well. The southern two tribes here, they're struggling financially. So I'm just going to put negative. And they've got good money. They got negative bucks down south. So as time goes on, God starts to raise up prophets. The prophets go to these kings, to Israel, not to Judah. Judah's got kings also. Some of the kings are very godly. If there's ever a godly king, he's always going to be from the south. Not one godly king in the north. But there were good kings, godly kings, and then some not so godly kings. Up and down, up and down, up and down in the south. The north, always ungodly. So God raises up prophets. And the prophets he raises up, they go to these kings and they say, you've got to come back to God. One of the most famous prophets just shows up. He just shows up over here. And he comes walking right into Samaria. And he says, because of what you're doing, I'm calling out a drought for three and a half years, no rain. Remember his name? That's Elijah. He just shows up on the scripture, comes to Samaria. Here's Mount Carmel, remember? So he's just south of Mount Carmel. He goes right into the king's palace and declares this drought. So we have these different prophets coming up, addressing these ungodly kings up here, over and over and over and over. When I was in Santa Fe, I spent about three weeks, just in the afternoons, from like one to three, before computers. And I, I took all the kings of Judah and all the kings of Israel and just made a chart. Judah, Israel, listed them all, put a timeline with the different years, took the godly kings, their reign, and just went like this with them. Remember there was a godly king? There were no godly kings in Israel, of course, but in Judah. And then, this period right here, and this period here, and this period here, and this period here, I thought, man, there's no godliness anywhere here. And then it just hit me. I don't know. What just, I thought, I wonder if, they had, if I look at the prophets when they were around. Now look at the prophets that God raised up, and do you know that the prophets filled all these gaps? Sometimes they, sometimes they, over, they overlapped. Hey, Christy, I can't talk to you right now, but can I call you back in about 15, about a half hour? I'll do it. Bye, sweetie. So, they overlapped the godly kings, but the point being, God always had a godly king or a godly prophet all the time for his people, which I found very interesting. Never the kings up here. So we've got this Samaria here. They're doing well. As the prophets from the south would come up, sometimes shepherds, like uh, Amos was a shepherd, or Amos was a shepherd, he would come up, and the people would say, yeah, right, God is blessing us. Want to compare bank accounts? And this is the beginning of the health and wealth gospel, way back here. Of course, of course God's pleased with our new worship. Look what we have. You're borrowing from us. Obviously God is pleased with us. Well, of all things, God raises up the Assyrians. The most violent, wicked, sadistic group of people of antiquity. The Assyrians. These are the bad ones. These make ISIS look like Boy Scouts. These guys are crazy. Same area, interestingly enough, but crazy folks. 
These are the ones that would skin you alive and then send you out into the desert with your infections to, just to die a slow, horrible death. These are the ones who would bury you up to your neck in the sand, smear you with honey, and then let the animals come and just lick and eat you. And then they'd come back later and just slop off your head and take their skulls. Back in Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians, piles, piles, stacks and stacks and stacks by the gates of Nineveh. They said hundreds of thousands of skulls have been found there of their enemies. They would take the skulls and take them home as trophies. So, really bad dudes. Well, the Assyrians, they look at Samaria. Guess what they see? We want that. They look here, not so much. They want that. So it turned out what people thought was God's blessing was actually the hook that brought their own judgment on them, which is interestingly mm -hmm. enough. So the Assyrians conquer Assyria, or conquer Samaria, northern Israel. These people are taken out. These are the lost ten tribes of Israel you hear about from time to time. That's them. They're gone, and they brought people from other areas and replanted them here. Now, some of the rural folks stayed here, intermarried, and you've got this half-breed. Part Israel, part implants. They were called, now not after the city, but this whole area became known as Samaria. And they became known as Samaritans. So the Samaritans are named after that capital city, but this whole region here became known as Samaria. So this is Samaria, and the Jews looked at them as not true Jews. They didn't wait. They intermarried with these transplants. That was an issue. So when you're reading the prophets now, if you hear them saying, Israel, O Israel, come back to the Lord, it's probably before this Assyrian captivity in 722 or so B.C. After that takes place, about 140 years go by, before God raises up another nation over here, Babylon, which is even stronger than the Assyrians, they wipe out the Assyrians and they start ruling the known world. Big, strong country. Egypt over here. Babylon just starts to flex. This is gone now. This is not, nothing here. Just a few nomadic people intermarrying with some of the leftover Jews. Jerusalem starts to drift away from the Lord. God raises up prophets. And that's why when you read some of the prophets, they say, Judah, Judah, remember what happened to Israel. That's why that says that. So if you read that, it happens after this captivity. So he's saying, Judah, remember what God did to Israel. You're following the same path. You're starting to walk away from the true worship of God. You're starting to go about worship by convenience, by compromise. They start bringing in the gods of Ammon, the gods of Moab. They're starting to bring it in. And they said, oh, no, no, don't do that. Remember what happened up here. As you know, the Babylonian captivity takes place in 586, the third one. And Jerusalem is taken out into Babylon for 70 years. <clears throat> when they come back after those 70 years, they come back to Jerusalem, they start to rebuild the temple that's been destroyed, much smaller, under Zerubbabel. They start to put a wall around Jerusalem. That's by Nehemiah. We found ruins, they found ruins of Nehemiah's wall in Jerusalem. They call it the Broad Wall, so the northern part of Jerusalem. When we're in Jerusalem, we're going to see that wall for certain. It's called the Broad Wall. It's a big deal when we're in Jerusalem one day. And we're looking at the Milo, and we're looking at all these different things. We'll come to Nehemiah's wall. That's an old wall. That's right after the Babylonian captivity, those 70 years. When you're looking at that wall, realize while they were building that wall, these folks were coming on down, the Samaritans. And they were coming down to help build the wall and to build the temple. And the Jews that came back from Babylon, they were from Judah, saw these guys coming in and said, you're not Jews. You're half-breeds. Get out of here. You're Samaritans. We don't want your help. That is why the Jews look at disdain towards Samaria. So that's what's going on here because they say, you are not truly Jewish people. You've compromised everything. We want no part of you. Their place of worship was right here between Mount Ebo and Mount Gerizim. Remember when Jesus went through Samaria, who went at the well? She says, you're talking to me, a woman, a Samaritan? 
Then she asked a question. Our father say you should worship here. That was under Jeroboam. Right. You say you should worship in Jerusalem. And she said we need to worship in spirit and truth. But that's what takes place there. That's the background to all of that. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting, today, today there's something called the West, yeah. So um, when those were uh, intermarried, yeah, right? And that's where it refers to in like Ezra, Ezra or Nehemiah at the end of the chapter where it says that they gave up their foreign wives, right? Is it talking about the down here too. These, these down here too. All these. Okay. They had done it also. He wasn't talking about them as much as these. Okay. They started doing the same stinking thing when they came back. Remember, remember Ezra comes back first and then Nehemiah? Mm -hmm. He's, you're doing the same thing. Nay, give him up, give him up, give him up. He pulls his beards out, his hair out, and he goes crazy on him. So there he is. So that's a good, good call. But yeah, that's down here. Don't do what these guys are doing. So important that we don't get caught up in the weird kind of worship. I mean, that's the whole seedbed, and it started drifting here. So when they come back, <coughs> they come back, oh, so today we hear something called the West Bank. And the West Bank, if you, well, our age, except maybe for Breger, Monica, maybe. I don't know if you guys know, ever even heard of the West Bank much. I don't know. You yeah, have? Okay, so it's okay. But the West Bank, they're talking about the Jordan River. So the West Bank of the Jordan River, here's the Jordan River right here, Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River. This is the West Bank. Everything from the Jordan River to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea is referred to today as the West Bank. The West Bank is the modern name for ancient Samaria. Mm -hmm. And that is full of Palestinians and some Jews <coughs> living there in their kibbutzes and that. But this was an area, when I first started going to Israel, that we wouldn't go to. The West Bank is like the Gaza Strip is now. So the West Bank was an area like, blah, blah, blah. so we didn't go through there. We did the same thing that Jesus would have done when he was walking. And the Jews, they, they go up one side, they go into the Galilee, all up in here. And then they come down the Jordan River Bank and uh, the Jordan River Valley and come back into Jerusalem. That's the path we will be taking. We take the old path. When things settled down in the West Bank, I did convince my guy one time to take us through here. So we went to Gerizim and Ebal, where the wood of the well was, and saw Jacob's well. We saw all that, but it was, uh, we got some stones and we got, you know, stuff like that. So we just don't go there much anymore. But that's our path this way. Come this way, we go up here, spend our time up here, shoot down the river valley, and come into Jerusalem. So it's that same type of thing. Now, this is ancient Philistia, or Philistia. Today it's called the Gaza Strip. And this is where today it's a little bit goofy. This is where they've, they've given this to the Palestinians now. And it's their own little government and their own place. And there's checkpoints and everything. What makes it interesting is Bethlehem is part of this. So, or it's near here. So we get a chance to go into, not the rough area, but it's Palestinian controlled area. And it's the only place we've talked about. Bethlehem's a little bit, a little bit edgy. But I know this looks a mess now, but does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Kind of have it. Yes. That's Old Testament Israel. <laughs> So when they're talking about Israel, the full 12 tribes, it's prior to 1 Kings 12. David and Solomon, Saul, those times. After 1 Kings 12, once Rehoboam decides to raise taxes, there's a split. Jeroboam becomes the king of the north. He makes some big mistakes. He had all the promises, blessings promised to him. But instead he decides to, to mess up and he becomes a standard of wickedness to the north. So that's Israel at that point up to the north, Judah to the south. Got it? Got it. Sweet. Yes. When we go to Petra, we're going to be down here. This would be Petra here. This is part of the Red Sea here. Elat. Petra's over here. Elat is over here. So your extension will go from Jerusalem, we'll take the bus down this way, go to Elat, go to Petra, back up to Tel Aviv, that will be our trip. A path that way, so we know we're going. Okay, got it? We'll hit Petra on another day, obviously. So that's Old Testament. Now, New Testament uh, Israel is very, <laughs> yeah, you can tell, it's just like that. <laughs> so instead of Judah, 
Instead of, I better just start over. Instead of Judah down here, instead of Judah, the name is changed to Judea. So very similar, but it's now it's Judea. So when you hear Judea, usually that's a New Testament designation of Judah. Sometimes you'll still hear Judah, but if you hear Judea, that's definitely New Testament title. So Judah, Judea, the same area, the same region, they're used interchangeably. Samaria, we talked about, it's no longer a capital city. It's this entire West Bank. So you've got... And then in the north, up here by the Sea of Galilee, the reason it's called the Sea of Galilee is part of the Galilee. Wow. Galilee. So you have three different regions. We have the Galilee up in the north, we have Samaria in the center, and we have Judea in the south. Those are the three main divisions of Jesus' day. So you want to make sure you understand those three. There's an area over in this area, it's no longer called the Arameans, over in here it says a P-E, this is Decapolis, sorry, Decapolis, something like that, means ten cities. There's ten Roman cities out here called the Decapolis. We'll hear Jesus mention that, we'll see it in the scriptures when we get there. And over here is Perea, down in this region over here. These are modern terms in Jesus' days. So if you're coming across the Decapolis, Perea, the Galilee, Samaria, Judea, these are the names of Jesus' day, New Testament. Kind of have it a little bit. We talk about Herod, he's from Idumea. Do I have a spell on there? Yeah. Idumea, that's the New Testament term for Edom. Herod is from is an Idumean. So Herod comes from ancient Edom. So Idumea in the south, Perea, Decapolis, the Galilee, Samaria, Judea. This is Jesus' times. We've got that. That's all we need. This right here, there's Galilee too, no, just this. Samaria and Judea was under the control of Pontius Pilate. Remember Jesus was from Nazarene up in the Galilee? Remember when they brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate and he's heard that he was from Nazareth? He goes, ha, huh, not my jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. That's Herod's jurisdiction. Herod had control of this. So he passed it off to Herod. That was why. He said he was from here. So just so you kind of have an idea how that all goes together. Any questions on any of this? If we can just get it a little bit in our heads so we have it, when we get there it'll make a whole lot more sense. Okay, doke? So we got. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. T said she had some kind of a map she made for us tonight. Is this the information on there? Pretty much. Okay. It's it's the map, but not the info. I put a little bit of info on the back or on the bottom. Just a little bit, but it's enough to uh, see what's going on. If you go back and just check the um, the video, this will make it very clear. Very clear. Okay. All right. Now, passports. Everybody in here should have passport issues taken care of, right? I'm just going to go through and ask. Yes? Monica, yes. Sandy, yes. Roger, yes. Passports? Yeah, I got you. Passports. Passports? Yeah, on the way. Okay, you've ordered them? Yeah. Okay, then that's all we need. Make sure they're ordered. Because it's going to take a couple months, probably. Yeah, that's what he was saying. Yeah, New Mexico. That's what we got. <laughs> that's what we got. As long as we got them, we're good. We're good. <laughs> We got that. Um, let's start talking about suitcases. We have about 15 minutes. Let's start talking about packing just a little bit. Um, we mentioned this a little bit. I want to hit stronger now. You don't want to bring everything. We said before, the first couple of days of the trip, everybody's looking pretty fancy. It's pretty fun to see. Everyone's got the matching shirts, matching pants, the hair's done well. Would that be a true statement, Roger? Pretty much, we're looking pretty good those first couple of days. As time goes on, not so much. 
And after a while, you'll see people wearing the same clothes three days in a row because they're comfortable. And um, sometimes the hairs need to get done and put a cap on, it's good enough, who cares? And um, don't get caught up into bringing an outfit for every day. I want to encourage you to bring things that you can wash in the shower. Travel shirts, sometimes a little bit expensive. One travel shirt can last you a week really well. And it's comfortable. I shower a lot with my shirt on. I just <laughs> wash that baby, get it clean up, rinse it out. It's dry in the morning. I put it on the next day. It's just what you do. And it works really, really well. So I want to encourage you, don't take a lot. Take stuff that you can wash. There's not going to be uh, washing machines available to us, I don't think. You know, you're not going to have a chance to wash. You can wash things in the tub, rinse them off if you want to. But don't just bring tons of stuff. Not necessary. Shoes are utmost important. Um, what kind of shoes did you bring, sir? Very comfortable. The um, walking shoes from REI. Walking shoes from REI. Comfortable uh, ones? How did that work for you? Very well. Very, very good well. at support. Uh, you can wear them in water. I'm dry the hand. I just... Oh, it's got to be it's got to be stuff that can get wet. Yeah. We're going to spend a lot of time and walking in water. And it will wet. stay on your feet when you get yeah. you stuff in sand in the water, mm -hmm. and you pull your foot up. You want your shoe still on your yes. foot, yes. so make sure not just like flip flops, like something that harnesses to your foot. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so make certain you've got Tiva good shoes. Really What's that? Tiva brand. Oh, they're really fantastic. Good. Mm -hmm. um, I have Tiva yeah. sandals that I wear, and they strap on. They work really well for me. So, not no toe outs, toe in. You like toe in. You to a cupboard. Okay. Go through some rough terrain. Yeah. yeah. It'll be, it'll be a stuff. So shoes are the thing you want to really aim at. Um, hats are a pretty good idea. On some of the places that we go to, we'll tell you the day before we go, but especially for the ladies, um, there are times you have to cover your shoulders or cover your legs. So we have these different wraparound broom skirt type of thing. You can wear shorts most of the time, but if we're going into certain sites, we'll tell you the day ahead so you know, just bring it with you, leave it on the bus. When we go to that site, then you just wrap it around your shorts. Go in, come out, take them off again. It will be warm, so you're not going to want to wear it all the time, usually. No and then, short shorts. No short shorts. Yeah. Now you can't go crazy. So you got to dress a little bit conservative. And then make sure your shoulders are covered. That's all we have. That's all I have. And make, your, make sure your shoulders are covered as well. Okay. And make sure your shoulders are covered as well. So we've covered all that. Make sure if you're going to use appliances, you need an adapter, an electrical adapter. Same as what I had in Bulgaria, right? Same type of thing. Same type of thing. Check with them. Make sure that works in Israel. I forget which one it is. Same one? Okay. So make sure you have that. The other thing you can do, and you have time to do it, is you just buy a... Uh, an appliance if you need a curling iron. They have curling irons in Israel. Buy it in Israel. And you don't have to worry about the adapter, and about packing it, getting over there, buy it in Israel, you leave it there. It costs, what, $12 or something? Not very expensive, get a cheap one, it's good to go. But they have everything you need over there, so you don't have to bring everything over and that type of thing. When we have suppers in the evening, they want the men to be dressed at least with long slacks and a uh, shirt with collars. So we come home, we, um, right there, that type of thing, but that's too hot, but I do get it. That's the look. It's just a real casual, or Uncle Dan's look, just a real casual, semi-dress look. Women, skirts, and, uh, and uh, some kind of little casual dress top. So every supper, we, we uh, shower before supper, get dressed up, and meet down there. Make sure you bring a swimsuit. If you swim or not, make sure you bring a swimsuit. A lot of times by the water. So bring swimsuits. And um, I'll talk about baptism. I'll hit baptism quickly. You're in Israel. I strongly encourage you to get baptized in the Jordan. Um, it's not going to cost you your salvation if you do. It's not going to cost your salvation if you don't. But you're in Israel. Why would you not do that? I and mean, that's just an experience. It amazed me. I've been there. This is my tenth, ninth or tenth trip. I had never been baptized in the Jordan River all the times I've been there. Never have, until this last time. And it was like, sweet, I'm going to do it. I've always baptized people. I've never been baptized myself. So this last time, Connie and I got baptized together with our son, uh, Brian, in Sitsky. 
and the two of them just baptize us together. It was fun. So as a husband and wife, it's fun to get baptized together. If you'd like, you can. You can definitely do that. You don't have to. You can. And um, it'll be pretty sweet. So that's the baptism. So on clothes, appliances, we've got that. Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Shoes are the big thing. Waterproof, comfortable shoes. Baptism, do it. We had, last time we had a couple people who weren't sure if they should or shouldn't. Just do it. Just do it. You will be good. Okay? Um, shirts, blouses, uh, for ladies, it's hot, you so <laughs> you may be tempted to wear sleeveless, but if you wear something with sleeves, it's a lot cooler on your um, skin. In fact, they recommend that you do wear something with sleeves. And the travel material is like perfect for that. It's long sleeves, but it keeps you cool. The wind just goes right through it. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about travel okay. material? Cotton? It's no. Huh? The um, sun shirts? The sun? What, what is that called? Do you guys know what those are called? I don't know. I know what you're talking about. It's actually a breathable material. Mm -hmm. I'll bring it next yeah. time we have class. I'll bring one. They sell it at like REI. And yeah. You ask for like a small section of things. Is that just sun protecting? Mm -hmm. Well, it's sun protecting. It's really breathable. Um, they normally have pockets <laughs> to put things, and the breathable um, part is the important part. Right. Well, I guess the sun's the sunscreen part is too. But right. and they wash and dry um, quickly. And they wash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they wash really easily, really dry really quickly, and they don't yes. wrinkle too bad. Or, yeah. So they're actually kind of perfect. Well, they're long time. They're expensive. Right, yes. But if you only take two or three shirts, that's not so bad. <laughs> it's cheaper. Yeah. It's cheaper. Yes. I've got a couple of those. So. Well, I'll just borrow yours. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll just bring one, you bring one, and we'll just yeah. rotate yeah, them all day. Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be fine. Is that okay, funny? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but in the evenings for dinner, your sleeveless dresses or short sleeves are good because you're inside. And then the sun goes down inside. So, yeah. So. <laughs> All right. So, David and Lisa, my uncle Dan and Aunt Kathy, right behind you. So, they'll be on the trip too. They're from North Dakota, but they'll be joining us. So, you know who they be. So, David and Lisa. Very nice to meet you. Yep. And then we have a uh, another lady from uh, Minnesota joining us. Her name is Carol. She's kind of a semi-retired, excuse me, retired veterinarian. We talked with her today. That's my aunt Kathy's sister. She'll be joining us. Mm -hmm. And then we have another couple from Minnesota named Larry and Barb, and uh, they'll be joining us. So we're gonna have a few people from the north uh, coming with. So. So you know awesome. who they are. That's who they be. Yes. So that's what we got. Our numbers are holding right around between 25 and 30. That just appears what it's going to be. So our last trip was 25, so it'll be about the same, maybe a few more, but it'll be real similar. I'll be on the large tours where there's been over 70, and then the small tours as little as 13. Um, both have advantages, but the small tours like this are really good for the people on the tour. Our bathroom breaks are a lot smaller. We have 70 people, one minute in the bathroom. 70 minute bathroom break. So this would be nice. This would be good if the smaller people. It's, 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 better. it's better. It's better. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. So, okay, I think we've got it. Thanks for being here, guys. We did it. Yes. Thank you. See you guys. That's it.